In my film, The Good Future, I talk a lot about what a good future is and how we would possibly get there. But of course, the film is rather short and I can't explain everything. So here I want to explain a couple of things I mentioned in the film when I talk about technology and the power of technology, when I talk about the green future and decarbonization, and when I talk about capitalism and the need for reformation. Recently, I've been speaking about this quite a bit in my speaking events, and I've started calling this the DDR. A DDR for Digitization, Decarbonization, and Reformation. And it's a great abbreviation for basically the three things that need to happen to provide us with a good future. First, about digitization. Everything around us is going digital. It's going virtual. It's becoming cognified, it's becoming intelligent, it's going virtually into the cloud, working remotely, working via Zoom, studying things online, working in the cloud, meeting in the cloud, dating in the cloud. Right? Everything is becoming technology. And technology is essentially leading us to a world where everything can be remote, everything can be virtual, but at the same time, we still have the strong need to get together as humans and to have real contact. But digitization and what goes with it, robotization and intelligization, as I call it, cognification and automation, are absolutely everywhere. I call these the game changers. Uh, if you want to know more about the game changers, you can just Google for GERD, my name, G-E-R-D, and game changers. You'll find lots of videos and blog posts on this. But basically, it's all these things coming together. So it's not just going digital, it's also being automated and going virtual, being robotized, becoming intelligent. That's all happening happening right now and this is primarily a good thing because it allows us to do things that weren't previously possible for example to change the future of energy to change the future of healthcare to redo financial services to redo insurance and so while this is a good thing on the flip side when we do too much of it and we use it for the wrong thing then we can have a real problem as Buckminster Fuller, my, one of my favorite and famous futurists, uh, once said, we have all the right technology, but we use it for the wrong reasons. And another saying, which I really like a lot in this context, is what E.O. Wilson once said, humanity's problem is the following. We have cave-like emotions, but paleolithic emotions. We have medieval institutions, and we have godlike technology. So when we use godlike technology that we are acquiring at this very moment all the time, like cloud computing and quantum computing and all these things that are all around us right now, when we're acquiring them, then we also have to find rules and social contracts around it. Because basically, too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. The great example is Facebook and generally social media which was a good thing for a long time, but then it turned into a bad thing, manipulating us and, and, and modeling society and corroding democracy. This is something where we have to look at and we have to say, okay, digitization is good, but too much of it is not good. Too much face recognition, too many cookies, too much tracking, uh, too many things that are invasive. That's when it becomes really bad. So we're going to need to protect humanity in this future of technology. As I like to say, the more we connect, the more we have to protect what makes us human. Because the ultimate future is going to be awesome humans, real humans, physical humans, on top of amazing technology. And, and that is going to be something where we have to look at. So it's basically about rules and guidelines and protection mechanisms and uh, um, basically what I call precaution. At the same time, we don't want to forego proaction, which is to go into it, but we have to be careful and find the right balance. That is going to be crucial for the future of digitization, and I'm glad that Europe and the European government is pushing very hard, the European Commission, for a future that's going to be balanced and providing us with human values. I think we're going to see in the very near future a kind of rehumanization. And other focus, what I sometimes call the new human renaissance, and other focus on making this valuable for humans and not turning us into victims of data mining, which is what social media has primarily become, and putting us back into charge with human objectives, including keeping our anonymity, keeping our privacy, allowing mystery while using technology, not despite of using technology. 
The second D is a decarbonization, which means turning the entire fossil fuel industry around the world on its head and redoing the entire logic of energy, redoing the logic of pollution and climate change into a circular economy, into sustainable systems, going away from fossil fuel, oil, gas and coal into alternative fuels that we've been cultivating for a long time, including, of course, on the top of that list, solar energy, wind energy, renewable energy, renewable fuels, for example, sustainable airline fuels, and, of course, ultimately, second-generation nuclear power and possibly fusion power. Big discussion about whether that basket is going to be solving everything. But clearly, we have the technology for this. We have to put our money into this. We have to take the $5.6 trillion of global fossil fuel subsidies and put that into green subsidies and shift the whole thing around to be a better emphasis on sustainable energy and sustainable solutions. Basically, my view, the circular economy, which puts everything back in its place and recycles and redoes and rethinks the entire logic, is going to be the only economy in 10 years. Any company that's not on the path of decarbonization and the circular economy in a sustainable environment is going to fail and will be disregarded in less than 10 years. We are heading towards a sustainability revolution. That means that all of us will be subject to evaluation whether we are part of the decarbonization or not. I'm launching very soon a decarbonization pledge, I'm pledging myself to decarbonize as much as I can everywhere and as quick as I can. And that includes defunding companies, moving money out and divesting from companies that are not on the path to this big change of decarbonization. That includes not buying from those companies. That includes doing things that have uh, previously have been unheard of, including an increase in carbon taxes for flying for meat and for many other things. Yeah, that sounds like a tough story, but the World Economic Forum has said roughly if we decarbonize and move towards what they call the nature intensive, the nature positive economy, we can generate trillions of new money and hundreds of millions of new jobs. This is a question of priority and of course a question of jet fueling science. All of that can be done. It's a question of decision making. The first one, digitization, is obvious, and I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's happening. The second one is subject to some major policy decisions because we're running out of time. We are literally at a fork in the road moment. At that moment in the next 10 years where we have to decide what future we want, we won't have much more than 10 years to solve this problem and we better get started now. This is utmost existential and it's going to be the main focus of many conversations we're going to have the next couple of years. Rapid decarbonization, that includes cars, it includes transportation, shipping, airlines, and so on and so on. Major decisions will be made and my decarbonization pledge is going to point that out in more detail. And this is a major thing, I think, along with digitization, of course, decarbonization can only be done with technology and new science. So Big Blue, not IBM, but Big Technology, and Big Green are hanging very closely together and we should invest lots and lots of resources in both along with the policies and the right decision-making and the right political will. That brings me to point number three, reformation. Right? Reformation is to redo something that's no longer working and to start again and to reorganize, to reset. Again, the World Economic Forum calls this the Great Reset, which is a little bit probably overambitious in many ways, but I prefer to call it the Great Transformation or the Great Reformation, which is kind of like going back to Italy and the Renaissance and, and maybe Martin Luther, you know, talks about reforming church and reforming society and resetting how we think of the world. The biggest issue we're having right now is that technology is capable of doing all these things, but we haven't actually done this because we are pursuing an old-fashioned approach to our society, the approach of extreme capitalism. Whatever makes money is fine. Whatever gets us there is fine, as long as it produces money. We focus on GDP, which is a 70-year-old description where already JFK, or Bobby Kennedy actually, said back then, GDP measures everything except that which is humanly worthwhile, which really matters to humans. And that is so true. We're measuring the wrong thing, and we're doing the wrong thing. We need to switch to the GPI, the Gross Progress Indicator, and everything that's related to it. We have to go beyond GDP as a 
the definition, and that has been discussed by people like John Elkington for a long time, a brilliant scientist, speaker, and writer, who talks about people, planet, profit. I'm going to add one thing to this, people, planet, purpose and prosperity. I think prosperity is better than profit, and uh, purpose is crucial these days because millennials between, say, 22 and 35 are looking for purpose. They're looking not just for prosperity. They're not looking for economic progress only. They're looking for wider sins in life. And purpose now, in many ways, is the new product. And as I said earlier about green, green in many ways is the new digital, and purpose is the new product. And green and sustainable is becoming the new profitable. There are lots of indications how this is happening. For example, the global corporate tax has now basically been signed off, which means 15% of any corporation around the world has to be paid in taxes, not like it was until now, where tax avoidance was basically rampant and everywhere. And that's already one big step in the same direction. Or take the vaccine policy of saying, well, maybe we should question the issue of patents and copyrights so that we can get it out quicker. Maybe we should question the things that were sanctified until now. Big discussion about that, big paradigm changes, the stakeholder economy, as the business roundtable calls it, talks about why that is the key to a future, to go beyond this very simplified thinking of capitalism as we know it. And of course, we don't really have any other word for it, but maybe we should be looking for one. I call it sustainable capitalism, post-capitalism green capitalism, human capitalism, whatever you want to call it, it moves beyond the idea of saying all that matters is growth and profit and jobs because if we pursue that strategy, as Milton Friedman has advised us in the 70s, the only purpose is to make money. If we pursue that strategy, we're going to implode and we have probably less than 20 or 30 years left on this trajectory. We have to change that and we have to change the stock markets to also allow us to prioritize people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. There is, in fact, a first stock market in San Francisco called the Long-Term Stock Exchange that does pretty much exactly this and looks for long-term results. Long-term thinking, not short-term thinking, wider thinking, holistic, human-centric, Earth-centric people, planet, purpose, prosperity. That is the great transformation. And from those three things that I've talked about, this is the toughest one. This is the hardest because it's easy to digitize. Everybody's doing it. It's not easy, but it's working. It's tough to really decarbonize, but changing society's viewpoint on what we want on a global level and to agree on it, that's a major project that will take all of the involved entities like the Millennium Project, the World Economic Forum, and of course the UN to pull together and create a new logic of what we want. Because here's the key question, as I said in the film, what kind of future do we want? We can have every future, but we have to make a decision. A good future is entirely possible. We just have to make the right decisions. Thanks for tuning in. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>